Well, good evening, and again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm Ian McQueen. I'm a, an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Surgery here at UCLA. And for this installment of the Esophageal Insights Lecture Series, I'll be discussing hiatal hernias with a focus on the clinical manifestations and management. I don't have any relevant disclosures for this talk. So the objectives for the next hour are to describe the anatomy relevant to hiatal hernias, uh, to understand the broad pathologic manifestations of hiatal hernias, to identify studies used in working up hiatal hernias, and to discuss the indications for surgery and options for surgery for patients undergoing treatment for hiatal hernia. So I'm going to start with a definition. So the hiatal hernia is a protrusion of any abdominal structure other than the esophagus into the thoracic cavity through a widening of the hiatus of the diaphragm. And so this is often a challenge for patients because this is a hernia that you cannot see, and it can be tough to conceptualize, but this is a hernia through the normally occurring esophageal hiatus, where the esophagus normally passes through the diaphragm from the chest into the abdomen. And so uh, this sits about where you see in the image here and is usually relatively small in size, allowing just the passage of the esophagus. This is a view of the diaphragm itself, looking from the abdomen up towards the diaphragm with the chest further into the screen. And the esophageal hiatus is labeled in the center of this image. And so it sits immediately anterior to the aorta. And as the esophagus passes through the mediastinum, it's immediately posterior to the heart and sits between the two pleural spaces. So I'll, I'll draw your attention to the extensions of the diaphragm traversing either side of the hiatus uh, and then on either side of the aorta down towards the spine. And these are the crua of the diaphragm. So the, the right cruise inserts to the right of the aorta and the left cruise inserts to the, the patient's left of the aorta. And we as surgeons get very focused on the area where we're working. And so we commonly refer to the muscle on the patient's right of the esophageal hiatus as the right cruise and the muscle on the, the left of the hiatus as the left cruise. But uh, for any anatomists in the crowd, we, we do remember that these are actually just portions of the same cruise, meaning that the same, uh, the muscle on either side goes down and inserts on the right side of the diaphragm. But in referring to the anatomy for surgical purposes, we, we usually refer to them as a left and right cruise. This is a cross section of, again, normal anatomy of the gastroesophageal junction or G junction or GEJ as it sits again in normal position. So the diaphragm muscle is uh, sitting transversely across the screen here. And in cross section, we see a few things here. We see that the normal anatomy of the esophagus and gastroesophageal junction is that it sits well below the diaphragm, usually a couple of centimeters, and that there are a few centimeters of intra-abdominal esophageal length in normal anatomy. And the esophagus uh, is held in place at the esophageal hiatus, which again is this hole in the diaphragm, by the phrenoesophageal ligaments. So that's the normal orientation for these things. And the fact that the esophagus travels into the abdomen or, or lies within the abdomen in normal anatomy allows for this acute angle between the esophagus and the fundus of the stomach called the angle of hiss. That's shown here, and this ends up being quite important for function of the stomach. So you can see in normal anatomy, this angle of hiss is acute and allows for food to pass from the esophagus into the stomach during swallowing. But when the pressure builds up in the stomach, it slides the uh, left wall of the esophagus over like a flap valve and helps prevent reflux back up the esophagus. So it works a bit like a one-way valve and it works in conjunction with the lower esophageal sphincter to prevent reflux. So what happens when the anatomy becomes abnormal? So the same picture is shown on the left of the screen here, which is the normal anatomy of the stomach, esophagus, diaphragm, and the esophageal hiatus. And when there's disruption of the phrenoesophageal ligaments, which hold the esophagus in place, the stomach can now uh, travel through the esophageal hiatus from the high pressure uh, environment of the abdomen up into the low pressure environment of the chest. And so this results in a portion of the stomach traveling up into the chest, and that is the hiatal hernia.
So as this is happening, you can see, uh, again, normal anatomy shown in figure A here. Figure B is a concept of kind of a pre-hernia where the esophagus is starting to migrate uh, up towards the chest. Um, and there's no true hernia in that the stomach is not up in the chest, but there is loss of that acute angle of hiss. Uh, and this becomes an obtuse angle. And then if this uh, goes on further, you get a true hiatal hernia. So this is the most common situation for a hiatal hernia, but it's also possible for some of the phrenoesophageal ligaments to uh, maintain their strength and for only a portion of the uh, hiatus to become disrupted, which usually means that the esophagus is held in place by the medial or patient's right side of the phrenoesophageal ligaments and part of the fundus herniates up uh, into the chest. So both of those are hiatal hernias. And as with anything, when there is variety, there's a classification scheme. So this, this is the classification scheme for hiatal hernias. We'll go through these in detail, but uh, there are types one through four. So type one is by far the most common type of hiatal hernia, and it's called a sliding hiatal hernia. And this constitutes 95% of all hiatal hernias. And this is where there's uh, circumferential disruption of the phrenoesophageal ligaments and uh, allows essentially for, as it sounds, the stomach to slip or slide cephalad into the chest. And this results in the loss of that angle of hiss between the esophagus and the fundus. In contrast, the additional 5% of hiatal hernias are what are called paraesophageal hernias. So all of these types two through four are paraesophageal hernias. And what this means is that to some degree, the phrenoesophageal ligaments remain undisrupted, which allows the fundus to migrate even further cephalad than the gastroesophageal junction. And so in type two, this is called a true paraesophageal hernia, the GE junction is maintained at its essentially normal location at or below the diaphragm, and the fundus alone herniates adjacent to the esophagus or in the paraesophageal position. Type 3 is a mixed type, meaning the GE junction has slipped or slid uh, cephalad, but the fundus is also herniated and remains higher in the chest than the GE junction, uh, which again maintains that angle of hiss. And then type four, uh, sometimes called a giant paraesophageal hernia, is any hiatal hernia where there is an organ besides the stomach herniated into the chest. And this is most often colon or omentum that herniates alongside the stomach. So patients frequently ask, just how big is my hiatal hernia? And this is kind of a final comment on anatomy. And the answer to this question is, complex, and they often show up with multiple reports or multiple studies showing different measurements. And this is just a matter of perspective. So if you ask an endoscopist, they'll tell you that the hiatal hernia is this big. And if you ask a surgeon, they'll tell you that it's this big. And those numbers are usually a different number of centimeters. And the reason for this, this is what an uh, endoscopist or gastroenterologist is seeing uh, when they're looking at a hiatal hernia. So you can kind of see the ring uh, here shown in purple, which is the hiatus. And so you can see the pinch of the hiatus. That's the diaphragm muscle pinching in the stomach. And then the GE junction is where the stomach uh, is snug around the, the scope up there. So this is a retroflexed view looking back up at the GE junction from inside the stomach. And so it's very easy to measure along the scope and say how kind of long the hiatal hernia is in axial dimension. Uh, we surgeons, on the other hand, uh, see it most often from a laparoscopic view, shown here. So here, uh, this liver is being uh, lifted up at the top of the screen by this instrument, and you can see the hiatus is shown in that dashed blue circle, and the stomach is then herniating through the hiatus. So we can only see the top of the hiatus, but you see there's much clearer cross section here rather than an axial length of the hernia. And this is what surgeons are interested in because when we repair hiatal hernias, this is the hole that we have to uh, sew to be the correct size to fit just the esophagus. So thinking about the clinical manifestations of hiatal hernias, there are many and they can seem somewhat confusing. So we're going to try to make some order of this and um, 
I group these into five main categories. So there is gastroesophageal reflux disease, gastric volvulus, Cameron ulcers, swallowing and GI symptoms, and respiratory symptoms. And you'll see this is kind of a smattering, but I think everything fits relatively nicely into these five categories. So the first is gastroesophageal reflux disease. So again, this is the pathologic reflux of fluid and acid from the stomach back up the esophagus through the gastroesophageal junction. And this alone can have an incredible number of different symptoms associated with it. So classically, there is heartburn, which is retrosternal chest pain that's uh, postprandial in timing. But there's also regurgitation, you know, subjective acid taste in the mouth. There's water brash, which is hypersalivation in response to reflux. A globus sensation, nausea, dysphagia, all these things can be associated with, um, with acid reflux. And then there are some objective findings. So there are, and there are some uh, extraesophageal manifestations of gastric reflux. So the extraesophageal manifestations include things like chronic aspiration and pneumonias, dental erosions, and voice changes. And then the objective findings that can be seen on endoscopy include esophagitis, peptic strictures, in Barrett's esophagus. So all of these are associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease. And this is most commonly encountered in type one or sliding hiatal hernias, again, because of the loss of this angle of hiss. So the one-way valve works well when the fundus is located in a level uh, above the GE junction and has an acute angle of hiss, but as it becomes more obtuse, uh, you can see it's, there's loss of that flap valve that prevents reflux. Additionally, the G junction moves and the lower esophageal sphincter moves from the positive pressure environment of the abdomen, where there's extrinsic pressure pushing, pushing on it and actually helping it squeeze tighter, up into the negative pressure environment of the chest, where there's intermittently pressure uh, uh, pulling the lower esophageal sphincter open, uh, rendering it less effective. So the next manifestation is gastric volvulus. So this is a pathologic twisting of the stomach, which can result in obstruction and ultimately can result in ischemia and necrosis of the stomach. And there are two axes on which this twisting can occur. Um, the organoaxial axis is shown on the left, and this is essentially that the pylorus and gastroesophageal junction are fixed in space and the stomach twists around the two of them. Uh, kind of along its long axis. And this is a little bit easier to picture than meso, uh, mesenteroaxial volvulus, which is more kind of that the pylorus and gastroesophageal junction move towards each other and the stomach twists along a vertical axis. And in reality, uh, volvulus can be a combination of these two types of types of twisting. So once this occurs, it commonly obstructs either at the gastroesophageal junction or at the pylorus or duodenum, and there are still uh, secretions being made by the stomach and gas forming organisms in the stomach, which can result in increased pressure, ultimately leading to um, ischemia and potentially necrosis of the stomach. So this is a, a true emergency if it happens in the acute setting and is a complete obstruction. This rarely occurs in sliding type hiatal hernias in contrast to the GERD, uh, but is common in types two through four, the paraesophageal hernias. And uh, this image of a type four paraesophageal hernia makes it somewhat clear how this could occur in that the GE junction is uh, to some extent pinned down by the, the diaphragm and the stomach then flips up above that into the space created by the hernia. So the third category of, uh, in our clinical manifestations is Cameron's ulcers and Cameron's erosions. So these occur due to ischemia from essentially pressure, uh, pressure caused ischemia at the pinch of the diaphragm where the stomach travels through the esophageal hiatus. And these uh, are associated with larger hernias as uh, larger hernias allow more of the stomach to be pushed through and there's more uh, gastric mucosa and wall of the stomach then bunched at that area to uh, have pressure exerted on it. And as there's reduced blood flow over time, the mucosa can break down and form these commonly linear erosions right at this level. So those are shown with the blue arrows in this slide. 
Um, these may be clinically apparent as either upper GI bleeding or an iron deficiency anemia, or they may be uh, diagnosed incidentally during endoscopy. On the note of iron deficiency anemia, one study found that up to 50% of patients with parasophageal hernias will have iron deficiency anemia, both as a result of Cameron's ulcers and as a result of chronic intermittent lobulus resulting in ischemia, uh, ischemia of the mucosa. So those are kind of the named uh, findings and sim syndromes that go along with hiatal hernias. And then there are just some nonspecific symptoms. So frequently these are uh, related to swallowing or the gastrointestinal tract. And these include dysphagia, which is commonly the result of angulation of the gastroesophageal junction in a paraesophageal hernia due to uh, large contents adjacent to the esophagus in the chest. Uh, it's possible to have blo bloating, belching, retching, early satiety, kind of these, these symptoms that are often hard to find a cause for, um, but when they occur in the setting of uh, paraesophageal hernia especially, uh, that's typically the cause. And of course, there's considerable overlap with these symptoms and GERD symptoms. Um, and from a management perspective, it's not all that important to uh, know which is which um, because they kind of fall into a management algorithm, which will sort it out. Um, but uh, there is overlap between those two syndromes. And finally, uh, there are respiratory symptoms that can be associated with um, large hiatal hernias, um, both from GERD, as we discussed, but also from direct compression of the lung and loss of pleural space or pleural volume. And this can result in dyspnea and reduced lung capacity on pulmonary function tests. And here's just a, a slice from a CT. This is a coronal slice from a chest CT um, showing uh, in the green circle there, that's intrathoracic stomach from a large hiatal hernia. And in the right lower lung, lung field, uh, you can see clear evidence of lung compression. There's atelectasis and uh, some uh, patchy consolidation. So that's all the clinical manifestations of hiatal hernias, which again are, are multiple. So it's important when you evaluate these patients to really do a careful history and to carefully elicit any symptoms that could be attributable to the, to the hiatal hernia. So I'm gonna move on to workup and management uh, hiatal hernias. And I'll be frequently referencing here, uh, this is the, the best society guideline out there for the management of hiatal hernias. Um, and it was put out by SAGES, which is a Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons back in 2013. And we'll discuss a little bit of literature that's more recent than this, but most of the recommendations made at that time are still valid. So much like the clinical manifestations, the uh, workup for hiatal hernia can seem complex and somewhat confusing. And so we'll try to make sense of it. Going to start with the way hiatal hernias are often diagnosed, which is incidentally on x-ray studies, MRIs, CTs, on endoscopy. Uh, there's a number of ways this can be done. And at that point, uh, we ask ourselves what additional studies are needed, which will be the, the focus of the next several slides. But it's important to start from the point that we should not do any studies that are not going to change our clinical management. And this got a strong recommendation from SAGES is a pretty safe place to start with your recommendation since this applies to pretty much all of medicine. But it's important to keep in mind what, what is we hope to gain from each study and what information we'll obtain from it. So here's a plain chest x-ray. Again, this is not usually used in the workup of hiatal hernia, but this can often be the way a hiatal hernia is diagnosed. And so on the uh, first image, you can see an air fluid level behind the heart um, and it's confirmed to be retrocardiac on the, the lateral image. And this is pathognomonic for uh, hiatal hernia. And so this will prompt uh, the rest of the workup we're going to talk about. So there are five studies that we'll discuss in the workup of hiatal hernia. But the mainstays are the, these two first two studies, a barium swallow and an upper endoscopy. And then we'll discuss the additional information that can be gained from cross-sectional imaging, esophageal manometry, and pH testing. But again, the barium swallow and the endoscopy are where the majority of the information is for these. So the barium swallow 
fits into the category of contrast studies. It's also called esophagram or an upper GI series. It's so very sensitive for diagnosing a hiatal hernia, and it provides anatomic information on the size and reducibility of hiatal hernias. Uh, if done with a video component under fluoroscopy, this can provide additional information on esophageal motility and uh, swallowing function, though not to the degree that can be shown through esophageal manometry, which I'll discuss in a little bit. But it also, again, on video can demonstrate gastric reflux if that's present. So you get quite a bit of information. And here's, here's an example of one of those studies. So looking at the image on the left, the esophagus shows as this vertical band of contrast, uh, which appears white on this image, uh, running down the image. And then the uh, diaphragm sits below that. And you can actually see the stomach is, has some contrast in it, again, appearing light in color and there's a pinch at the uh, proximal stomach where the diaphragm is, is pinching the stomach, and that's the hiatus itself. And then we see this large white area here, which is the fundus of the stomach. So this barium swallow pretty clearly shows this to be a paraesophageal hernia. And it actually looks like the esophagus uh, traverses almost all the way down, if not all the way down to the diaphragm. So this looks to be essentially a true paraesophageal or type two hiatal hernia. So quite a bit of information on anatomy from that study. The next study that's most frequently used in the workup of hiatal hernias is, is an upper endoscopy or esophagogastroduodenoscopy, EGD. So this allows, um, doesn't have quite the same sensitivity, but it is still very sensitive for uh, diagnosing a hiatal hernia and allows for mucosal evaluation. So it can diagnose esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, Cameron ulcers, uh, and other uh, pathologies of the mucosa. And if the scope cannot traverse through the stomach into the duodenum, that can, can be uh, diagnostic of a volvulus as well. So this is another quite useful study. So we're going to compare this to our uh, barium swallow here. So this is the same patient. This is the barium swallow image, which looked like a type 2 paraesophageal hernia. And these are the endoscopic images from the same patient. You can again see uh, the outline of the esophageal hiatus here. We're in a retroflex view in the stomach looking back up towards the, the esophagus. And so you can see here that the GE junction where the scope is snug against the, the stomach up here is not actually at the, at the diaphragm. So there is a sliding component to this hernia, but it's very difficult to see the paraesophageal component on this hernia. And so on endoscopy, the, uh, this was actually thought to be just a pure sliding type hernia. And so it's not until we combine the two studies that we get the true anatomy understood for this hernia. And then there were some very subtle uh, Cameron erosions on this patient as well, which were diagnosed on endoscopy. So the two studies really work well in concert to give us the full scope of information on these hernias. Uh, Cross-sectional imaging is less commonly used, but can be useful. Um, it does provide some three-dimensional evaluation. It's uh, easy for many providers to look at and interpret. Um, and it is especially useful in an urgent setting to evaluate for volvulus as it's uh, quite fast and, and uh, can be quickly interpreted. It's just a representative image of uh, CT of the chest showing uh, intrathoracic stomach. So there's two parts of the stomach here in cross section, uh, which does put this at risk for volvulus as it appears, in, you know, you can't see both parts of the stomach connecting here. There's probably some twist, but we don't see any thickening of the gastric wall and it's enhancing nicely. So we do get some good information from a CT scan. Esophageal manometry. So now we're moving into the studies used not so much to diagnose um, and evaluate the hernia itself, although this does give us a sense of the axial size of the hiatal hernia. But this is a study more geared at determining what management we should pursue, especially when we're considering surgical management. So this uh, evaluates the motor function or motility of the esophagus and can rule out um, other motility disorders like achalasia and gives us a sense of whether the patient has a normal amount of uh, squeeze to their swallows or whether this is uh, impaired in any way. It is uh, often challenging to perform in paraesophageal hernias. As I mentioned, there's angulation often in those hernias of the GE junction that can make it challenging to get this probe all the way down into the stomach. 
I'm going to do a very brief look at the output from some of these esophageal manometries. Uh, these these uh, could be an hour long lecture each. Um, but uh, this is a high resolution esophageal manometry. Uh, so a probe is passed all the way down the esophagus. And the output looks like this with the length of the esophagus on the left side of the graph here. Starting from the mouth up at zero down to the stomach at the bottom. And then time is on the x axis. And so the patient swallows, and you can see these higher pressures shown in yellow and red here, then travel down the esophagus. And so this is roughly normal. And then you can also see another pressure marked at the, the crura of the diaphragm as well. So if that's a normal manometry, then an abnormal manometry might look like this. So there's still a decent propagation of the swallow here, at least to my crude surgeon's interpretation, but you can see two pressure lines along the bottom here. There's one at the actual diaphragm, and there's one above that at the lower esophageal sphincter. And that shows us that the lower esophageal sphincter is located above the diaphragm up in the chest. So it's, uh, again, indicative of a hiatal hernia. And the final study I'm going to cover is pH testing, uh, which is also called pH monitoring, pH probe study. And then there are specific methods of doing this, like the BRAVO study. And this provides an objective evaluation of gastroesophageal reflux, specifically acid reflux. And is not used for diagnosing a hiatal hernia, but can be used to confirm GERD in the presence of a hiatal hernia. And so this both uh, gives an objective sense of how much reflux is occurring and provides a correlation between acid reflux episodes and the symptoms the patient is experiencing. And the output looks something like this. Uh, so you get a table showing the number of reflux episodes in a 24 or 48 hour period, the amount of time when the esophagus is subjected to an acidic pH. And then the, the main output is this Demeester score, which is a composite score based on the above data that gives you a number. And if it's above 14.72, you say, yes, this, is, this confirms pathologic acid reflux. And then the patient can, can report when they're having symptoms and it's uh, compared to the data from the uh, pH testing. And so you can see, for instance, this patient um, had 59% uh, correlation between when they felt they were having heartburn and when there was actually acid in the chest. So it can be quite helpful to confirm GERD if that diagnosis is in question. After your workup is complete, some patients are appropriate for medical management and some are uh, appropriate for surgical management. And so we're going to cover now who needs to see a surgeon and who needs an operation. So the first thing to cover is any indication for emergent operation. So any patient who needs to go to the operating room immediately, or at least to the emergency room. And these uh, almost exclusively end up being patients with gastric volvulus. So like I mentioned, this can result in strangulation, ischemia, and ultimately uh, necrosis of the stomach if it goes untreated. Um, can have gastric outlet obstruction resulting in uh, intractable vomiting. And ultimately it can progress to perforation and, and uh, this condition has a high associated mortality, even with uh, rapid operation, and so this needs to be evaluated uh, immediately by a surgeon. Um, and then very rarely you could have uncontrolled bleeding from a Cameron ulcer or uh, respiratory compromise from direct compression of the lung. Uh, these are exceptionally rare, and in the case of bleeding, this would probably be treated with, uh, with uh, both a surgical and an endoscopic approach. So those are the emergency surgical indications. And then it's important to cover when surgery is not indicated. And so uh, patients often have incidentally diagnosed sliding hiatal hernias. And any patient with this condition who does not have GERD and does not have symptoms attributable to the hiatal hernia does not need a repair. And again, the, the SAGES guidelines give this a strong recommendation. And it just makes sense. This is uh, almost always so if it's a sliding hernia, it has a very low risk of any serious complications like um, volvulus, and GERD is the main pathologic manifestation for these sliding type hiatal hernias or type 1 hiatal hernias. So no repair is indicated unless there's GERD present. And then we'll talk about elective repair. So these uh, become a little more varied, but which patients should uh, be evaluated for elective repair of their hiatal hernias? And these break down into, again, four main groups. 
So we're going to talk about uh, these in more detail, but uh, sliding hiatal hernias with GERD, where the GERD warrants an anti-reflux operation, should be uh, evaluated for repair of their hiatal hernias in an anti-reflux operation. And uh, we'll cover this a little more in a moment. But all symptomatic parasophageal, so this is that type two through four, all symptomatic parasophageal hernias should be repaired. And some asymptomatic parasophageal hernias should be repaired. And this last line, I'm not going to talk about much more after this, but any patient who's undergoing bariatric surgery, so these are often uh, gastric sleeve operations or gastric bypasses, any patient undergoing that operation where the surgeon is already operating on the foregut, uh, if there's a hiatal hernia present, it should be fixed at the time of surgery. So we'll look a little more closely at sliding hiatal hernia. So again, these are the ones that often, most often manifest with GERD and rarely have problems with volvulus or other emergency indications for repair. So patients with GERD and associated sliding hiatal hernia uh, are appropriate for medical management of their GERD, but there are still operative indications for GERD. And if the patient meets any of these, they should be they should be offered an operation. So these include failed medical management, meaning the patient has insufficient symptom relief with medical management of their reflux, or patient preference not to continue medical management of their reflux, um, or extraesophageal manifestations of GERD, or complications of GERD, such as a peptic stricture. Rarely type 1 or sliding hiatal hernias meet other indications for operation unrelated to GERD, and this could be things like dysphagia or Cameron's ulcers. So uh, just to look a little more closely at the patients who are failing medical management of GERD, you know, there, there's a very low number of patients with GERD who actually end up pursuing fundoplication, despite the incredible number of patients with GERD in, uh, nationwide. And there's about 30% of patients with chronic GERD who are dissatisfied with their medical management but never pursue any additional surgical treatment. And so this is kind of what's considered the, the therapy gap. And these patients should at least be given a consultation with a surgeon to consider surgical management to their GERD. And for patients with hiatal hernia, that includes hiatal hernia repair. Uh, parasophageal hernias have different indications for repair. So essentially any symptomatic parasophageal hernia should be repaired. And it's especially true for those with uh, obstructive symptoms um, that may be indicative of intermittent chronic volvulus. And then the recommendation is uh, sort of wishy-washy about routine elective repair of completely asymptomatic parasophageal hernias. The traditional management of these was that they all got repaired. They all were recommended to be repaired. And now the, the recommendation is that the surgeon should consider the patient's uh, age and comorbidities and uh, make a decision uh, with the patient that uh, incorporates those characteristics. So first, all symptomatic parasophageal hernias should be repaired. And this results in quality of life improvements, um, but it also is because symptoms usually indicate a potential for volvulus and the mortality is exceptionally high after, after these events. So even if the patients undergo emergency surgery, uh, the emergency surgery mortality rate for hiatal hernia repair is quoted in some papers as up to 17%. So the idea is to avoid the need for emergency surgery by repairing these when they're uh, in their earlier symptomatic state. So what about older patients who have symptomatic parasophageal hernias? There's uh, some controversy about whether these patients should be offered repairs, even if they're symptomatic. And the, the data generally support offering patients a repair for symptoms, regardless of their age. And this is a series, uh, one of the larger series out there of about 500 patients. And 80 of these patients uh, were, sorry, 100 of these patients were over the age of 80. And they all underwent elective uh, parasophageal hernia repair for symptoms. And there's a few points to look at here. The first is that there was a higher complication rate in the patients greater than 80 years old. This was as high as 45%. But the study made it um, an important point that these were not more serious complications compared to the younger patients. So it was comparable complications, just in a slightly higher incidence. And importantly, uh, there was no mortality in the study at all, regardless of patient age. 
And so the conclusion of this is that parasophageal hernias can be safely repaired in physiologically stable patients, irrespective of age. And the incidence of complications may be expected to be higher in older patients, but the complications severity and mortality are similar to those of younger patients. So what about if a parasophageal hernia is asymptomatic? And I should start by saying that there is debate in the uh, expert community as to whether this actually exists as a, an entity, meaning many providers think if you question a patient closely enough, you'll find some symptoms, often those vague GI symptoms I was mentioning that are attributable to the parasophageal hernia. But for parasophageal hernias that are asymptomatic or essentially asymptomatic, Traditionally, we recommended that all these be repaired. And again, this was uh, largely out of a fear of having to face emergency surgery. And now the conclusion is that it's important to consider age and comorbidities in making this decision. And this is a study that's most often quoted in supporting this uh, change in practice. So this was a study out of Annals of Surgery in 2002, and it interestingly didn't include any patients directly. This was in a decision analytic model, which in, incorporated patient data from 20 other studies in the literature, as well as a database of patients uh, that was publicly available. And they compared uh, in these theoretical patients that they created in their decision model, they compared elective laparoscopic par parasophageal hernia repair to watchful waiting. And uh, their analysis of this database uh, led them to believe the mortality of emergency surgery was actually much closer, closer to five, uh, sorry, much lower, closer to 5%, and that the mortality rate of elective surgery was about 1.4%, and that's a generally accepted number. And the annual risk of requiring emergency surgery was 1.1%. And they took this last number, the 1.1%, and calculated lifetime risk of requiring emergency surgery based on a patient's age and an average life expectancy. And this drops off dramatically after age 65. And so they took this data to suggest that for patients at age 65, the uh, elective laparoscopic hiatal hernia repair actually resulted in a mild reduction, but essentially a net even quality adjusted life year expectancy compared to watchful waiting. And so the conclusion from this is that for patients older than 65, or poor surgical candidates, it's probably reasonable to perform watchful waiting. And for younger, healthier patients, repair of asymptomatic parasophageal hernias is probably still indicated. So what are the options for uh, treating these surgically? Uh, this first question is pretty straightforward, which is what approach should we use? And the laparoscopic uh, transabdominal approach seems to be the absolute best approach for almost all hiatal hernias, meaning the alternatives are open transabdominal, which is a you know, large abdominal incision, or a transthoracic, which is a large thoracotomy incision. And it, it's pretty intuitive that um, the pain from the five millimeter laparoscopic incisions will be less and recovery will be quicker. And the uh, other outcomes are, are exactly comparable between these, uh, uh, between these approaches. So for, for almost all patients, we recommend a laparoscopic operation. And then the other operations are available in certain circumstances, such as if it's a recurrent hernia or there's already mesh at the hiatus, uh, sometimes these other approaches can be uh, helpful. And this is, uh, there are many ways to perform a laparoscopic hiatal hernia repair. This is the, the port layout that I use. It's five incisions, each one five millimeters in size, occasionally an extra incision if uh, there's a challenging dissection. And the operative steps include uh, dissection of the sac, and usually the sac is excised, uh, mobilization of the esophagus to obtain that intra-abdominal esophageal length, posterior closure of the cura, as in posterior to the esophagus, and then almost always uh, there's an anti-reflux operation performed in conjunction with this hiatal hernia repair, and the most common is a fundoplication. Take a look at how this looks in an actual patient. Uh, this is a Tidal hernia looking up towards the hiatus. Again, the stomach is traversing into the hiatus, and the instrument is actually inserted through the uh, into the hiatal hernia. And you can see the crew of the diaphragm on either side of the stomach here. 
So once the sac is dissected and uh, completely uh, removed from the mediastinum, uh, this is what you're left with. Again, this is the hiatus here. The crura now are completely exposed, and there's uh, several centimeters of intraesophageal, interabdominal esophageal length. And the next step is to close the crura posteriorly. So again, here's the muscle on either side sewn together. Uh, this is what it looks like in the patient. I use pledgets, are these little white felt pads to help buttress the repair. Um, and then esophagus, you can see now fits snugly through the hiatus. And finally, perform an anti-reflux operation, which here is a Nissen fundoplication or a wrap of the fundus around the esophagus. Uh, it's possible to uh, find that you cannot get enough esophageal length. This is a condition called short esophagus. And this is just a, a quick look at what the options are for that. Uh, essentially, the usual treatment is to remove a wedge of the fundus of the stomach to create a tubularized section of the stomach just below the GE junction, which then serves as kind of a, a new portion of the esophagus. And this is to allow your wrap and your uh, stomach to sit in the abdomen without any tension on your repair. So there is still quite a bit of controversy as to whether or not mesh should be used to repair hiatal hernias. And there are certainly proponents and opponents, and the data are somewhat mixed. So there's actually reasonably strong evidence that short-term recurrence rates are lower if mesh is used for reinforcement. But there's not adequate long-term data or large, large studies to support this. And so SAGES you know, came short of saying that they recommend for the use of mesh at the hiatus. And there are multiple different ways to use mesh, but it's essentially placed across the repaired hiatus or the repaired, uh, the curl repair. And it can either be a strip of mesh like you see on the left, or there are you know, devices and products made specifically for this, like a keyhole mesh shown on the right. And these are three kind of representative studies for, uh, to look at this question. And you know, they're all relatively small studies, fewer than 100 patients. And these were relatively large defects, so greater than eight centimeters for this study and greater than five for, for uh, the study on the right. And it was short-term follow-up, anywhere from one to five years. And there was, uh, in two of the studies, there was lower recurrence in the treatment arm, meaning those patients who got the mesh. Here it's zero versus 22%, here it's eight versus 26, and then no difference in the, the last study. And they had no mesh related complications in, in any of these groups. The counterpoint to this, you say, okay, there's some evidence that the short-term recurrence is better, why not just use it? The counterpoint is that uh, there can be mesh-related complications, and often these are, are quite problematic at the hiatus or at the esophagus, and these include mesh erosion into the esophageal lumen or esophageal stenosis, and those conditions are quite difficult to treat. And so the decision to use mesh or not has to be weighed against this potential of these rare but, but catastrophic complications. And so you know, I think a selective use of mesh is supported, and uh, I use it in my practice if there's any uh, reason that I can't primarily close the crura successfully, but I don't use it routinely. And then finally, after you finish repairing the hiatus, there's a um, question of whether you should perform an anti-reflux operation. And it's uh, pretty much universally agreed that for a sliding hiatal hernia where GERD is the primary problem, a, an anti-reflux operation, which is most commonly a fundoplication, is essential. And then Sages, again, kind of hedged, hedged a little bit here and said it's important to perform during a parasophageal hernia repair. And it is described as a portion of uh, most parasophageal hernia repairs in the literature, but there's not strong evidence that it's 100% necessary in parasophageal hernia repairs. And you have multiple options for anti-reflux operations. So the Nissen and Toupe fundoplication are by far the most uh, time tested, uh, but there are other options that are relatively newer and uh, have various benefits. And so these are the transoral incisionless fundoplication or TIF, uh, magnetic sphincter augmentation or link. And then we occasionally use a Roux Y gastric bypass as well. The Nissen fundoplication is by far like the most common, like I said, and it's been around the longest, it's the best studied. Uh, and this is done by just taking the fundus of the stomach, wrapping it around the distal esophagus and suturing it to itself. And uh, in contrast, the toupee uh, is not 360 degrees, it's usually about 270 degrees or a three quarters wrap and the fundus is sutured directly to the esophagus. 
the, both of these wraps work not by exerting pressure on the esophagus, but by restoring that acute hiss angle, the angle of hiss between the esophagus and the stomach. And you can see that when the fundus is pulled up, that angle becomes uh, essentially closed to either very acute or zero degrees. And that restores that natural reflux barrier. In choosing between these two, there, the, the data are actually somewhat conflicting, but there's, there's kind of common practice and the data don't contradict the common practice. So this is what's practiced by most surgeons is that the Nissen is the default choice. And if uh, motility is normal, uh, this has excellent symptom relief and uh, has a slightly higher rate of dysphagia, but you know, this is usually transient and, and uh, this is the kind of shorter operative time and more standard approach. And this has excellent results and has a 85 to 90% satisfaction and symptom relief rate. The Nissen, sorry, the toupee or other partial fund applications are often the choice for patients with poor motility. The thinking is that there's less resistance to um, the esophageal passing a bolus into the stomach if uh, there's not a full 360 degree wrap. And there is slightly less dysphagia associated with this. It's uh, somewhat technically more challenging as a slightly longer operative time, and it has comparable symptom relief. But some of the retrospective studies kind of question whether this has comparable long-term reflux control and so this is not the, the default operation, but is a good option for patients with impaired motility. And then uh, moving into some of the, the newer technologies and options out there. So there's transoral incisionless fund application or TIF. And uh, Dr. Mufasami gave a great talk on this some time ago and definitely worth listening to. This is essentially a fund application done with a stapler uh, through the mouth, through the esophagus, and uh, done under endoscopic vision. And it's, uh, it's not incisionless if you have to put incisions on the abdomen to fix the hiatal hernia, but the actual fund application itself is incisionless. So this is a, a good option and has good outcomes and uh, is slightly less altering to the anatomy than a surgical fund application. And there's a magnetic sphincter augmentation or LINX, L-I-N-X. If you Google this, uh, you'll find that people on the internet like wildlife photography much more than they like spelling, but we're talking about the links in the lower right-hand corner here. So this is a device that sits at the lower esophageal sphincter, and it's essentially a bracelet made of a strong magnets, and it sits loosely around the esophagus, not exerting pressure when the esophagus is at rest, and it exerts between 20 and uh, 25 millimeters of mercury pressure, and the idea is that the normal intragastic pressures are not enough to overcome this, open it up, and allow uh, anything to reflux into the esophagus, but uh, normal peristaltic pressures in the esophagus can still move a food bolus past this. And this is what it looks like actually deployed in the in the abdomen that goes around the esophagus. It's a relatively quick laparoscopic procedure, a little bit quicker than a fund application. Uh, this does have strict eligibility criteria, meaning you can't have a large hiatal hernia. Uh, it's only for small hiatal hernias with normal motility but is a, a good option for some of those patients and has the, the benefit of being less altering to the anatomy and that if the hiatal hernia recurs, uh, a nissen fund application that recurs uh, up into the chest is often problematic or symptomatic and the Lynx device works uh, equally well because it's not reliant on um, its location. It works equally well in the chest or in the abdomen. And these are the outcomes of a five-year study with links, uh, which are quite good as compared to controls, but there are no long-term data to guide the use of links. And a final option here is a gastric bypass. So this is the same uh, Roux and Y that's done for uh, morbid obesity. And this is often the operation of choice for patients with morbid obesity and GERD. And this just reroutes the uh, gastric acid into the intestine downstream so that in order to have esophageal reflux, it would have to travel all the way up this limb of small intestine into the esophagus, and that's uh, very, very rare to occur. So this is a very effective anti-reflux operation, but it does result in weight loss. It does result in an alteration in eating patterns, and so it's not for most patients. So I'll wrap up with a few conclusions here. So the clinical manifestations of hiatal hernia include GERD, gastric volvulus, Cameron ulcers, swallowing and GI symptoms, and respiratory symptoms. 
It's important to evaluate for all of these when you're seeing a patient with hiatal hernia. And repair is indicated for sliding hiatal hernias with an operative indication for GERD, any parasophageal hernia with symptoms, and asymptomatic parasophageal hernias in young and healthy patients. And there are a, a variety of anti-reflux operations which can be combined with laparoscopic hiatal hernia repair to optimize outcomes. Well, again, thank you for your attention. I really enjoyed getting a chance to speak to all of you tonight.